started. Um, my name is Jay Doherty. I'm the Director of Clinical Education for Quantum Rehab. Um, been in the industry for about 28 years, 14 years working as an OT in the field, and uh, 14 years now working for Quantum. So split my uh, split my professional career between manufacturing and therapy. So I'll let Mary introduce herself. And my name is Mary Shea. I'm an occupational therapist. I work at Kessler Institute, which is in West Orange, New Jersey. And I teach at some of the local um, colleges in the New York City area. So we're going to be talking about considerations when traveling with a power wheelchair specifically. Um, I thought this would be a really good topic because, and we're going to focus a great deal on air travel because, let's face it, that's where the most fear is when you're traveling with a power wheelchair. Um, but let's, uh, from disclosure standpoint, I do work for a wheelchair manufacturer. They pay my salary. Um, this will have nothing to do with quantum chairs necessarily. It is going to be very unbiased. Um, and Mary works for Kessler. Um, pictures and photos, we have permission for everything um, to, that we're using. Um, so if you have any questions, let us know. Uh, learning objectives wise, we're going to spend a good amount of time, Mary will spend a good amount of time going over airline travel because that is such a big piece of having a power wheelchair. Um, so we'll talk about three considerations when you're traveling with a power wheelchair by plane. Um, we'll also talk about um, how much do you need to think ahead when you are traveling with a power chair because there's a lot of planning involved that we're going to talk about. And then differences between occupied and unoccupied transits because when you get to your location are you going to be able to travel safely. So when we're talking about travel, you know, we could be talking about planes, we could be talking about automobiles, we could be talking about pl trains and buses, um, a variety of different ways to get around. So we're going to touch a little bit on everything. So when we are talking about air travel, really we're talking about the maximum amount of planning that's needed when you're talking about air travel, especially with a power wheelchair. Um, think about this, you know, that is that person's mobility they are turning their chair over to a total stranger to put it into a plane and get it to where they're going safely. We all know what our luggage looks like when it gets there, right? Um, I've actually, you know, I, I travel by plane a lot given my job and I get stranded places. I get, um, I, I lose luggage or it shows up late. You can't have a wheelchair show up late. That doesn't work. Um, so there's a certainly an anxiety and a fear when they're traveling by plane because they lose control of their equipment. Um, when you land, how are you going to get around? So the things you need to think about, are you going to use public transportation? Are you going to use private transportation or rent a van, a wheelchair accessible van to get around? Um, if you're traveling by train or bus, it's a little bit different. Um, it's, it's a little less planning and your, your actual power chair stays with you. You actually are in your power chair inside the train, inside the bus. Um, Amtrak does a great job with ramps for accessibility purposes. Greyhound or, or any of the bus companies, a little more interesting. Um, you know, a lot of folks that are using power chairs will use a lift to get into a van. Well, a bus is about twice the height they're going up. And I did some research. There, it's a, most of your lifts on your buses are between 600 and 1,000 pound capacity. So most of our power chairs are 300, little over 300 pounds. And then you add the weight of the person in there. We're very close to that 600 pound weight capacity on some of those lifts. So again, that's part of that planning process. People in power chairs need to call ahead see what the capacity of the lift is, see how the tie downs all work on the bus itself. Or is it gonna work for them? Um, but they do have full control over their power chair because they're actually physically sitting in it. So how accessible is it also once they get to their destination? What are they gonna need to do? Because yeah, the bus got them there. How are they getting around now? So there's that additional, uh, their additional planning piece and um, you know, the when they get to their destination if it's not in this country how accessible is the train station how accessible is the bus station for them if they're traveling by car it's about we still consider it a moderate amount of planning that's going to be needed 
Um, are they using their personal vehicle? Or are they renting a vehicle? Or are they hiring a driver? And does that driver have a good reputation of showing up on time? Um, they have, again, they have full control over their chair in that situation, a little more versatility, and they can carry their equipment with them. So shower chairs, commodes, things that they may need, you could put that in the van, especially if it's your own personal vehicle that you're traveling with. So Mary's gonna take us through some of the nuts and bolts of air travel. All righty. So what are the issues that many people run into, right? There's no shortages of stories that we all hear from our clients of flying with chairs and you know, you're trying to figure out where's the, where's the problem, where's the gap here, what's happening? And so you hear, what are the big things that are happening with our clients? One is sometimes damage to them. I've had clients who've had like fractures from the transfer and stuff. So that's one set of issues or even pressure injuries because of the transfer and scraping their butt on like the armrest of the, um, the airline seat and things like that. Also, um, just if they're sitting in the seats and just not doing pressure relief, what's happening? And then the flight gets delayed and they're not thinking about it because they're frustrated about the delay and worried about maybe they didn't go to the bathroom or something like that. And then they end up with skin issues from that. Other issues are um, damage to the actual wheelchair. And I mean, you see the cartoon up there. I mean, there's nothing worse than that. And it's happened to people where they, they get to their destination and their wheelchair is in pieces. Um, so very frustrating on that end. And then of course, like Jay went into some of the transportation issues once they are at their destination, sometimes it doesn't always work out. So you make assumptions and you hear all these, you know, we all do research and you just never do enough research with air travel, you have to do more. So a lot of the, the lifts he was talking about to get into buses and to get into um, some of the shuttle vans, they typically have a 600 to 1,000 pound week capacity. But I was recently on a trip with someone and um, we're there and all the, all the lifts are the same for the big, the big buses that bring people from ships to these islands, et cetera. And so we're looking at this shuttle bus lift and it's not working. And we're like, what's going on? And all the directions are in Japanese. So thank God for Google Translate. But when we translated it, the weight capacity of the lifts were only 375 pounds. So can't lift anybody with a power chair with power seat functions. So pretty interesting when you do a deeper dive. So the one big thing we're gonna get into is um, you can't have enough communication. And there are always things that are coming up. So what are the top things or issues that people have with flying? So wheelchairtravel.org um, listed the four major causes of damage to wheelchairs. And one of them is that wheelchairs are physically lifted and unfortunately sometimes dropped by airline personnel because they don't know where to lift from. Uh, wheelchairs are not always properly secured in the cargo hold and you'll see why because that could easily be an issue. Wheelchairs unfortunately don't fit upright in the cargo holds of some of the planes and they're stored on their side. That's a recipe for disaster. And lastly, wheelchairs are left out on the tarmac and unfortunately if it's raining or snowing, then everything's getting wet and, wet and things happen. So number one thing, make lists, you know, and that's the biggest thing we can help educate our clients to do is make tons of lists, lists for each part of the process, for what you're bringing with you, who to talk to, um, make sure you have all your medications, you have like a travel bag for your wheelchair components, everything that can come off, should come off. Um, also other equipment that you need in terms of um, most people who are in powered wheelchairs often need more supportive bathroom equipment, so how are they getting that to and from their destination? And just thinking about when you do land, who is a supplier resource at that destination? So things along those lines are what should be included in those lists. Um, there are uh, air traveler, um, uh, the Air Act, uh, Carrier Access Act. And what's so good about this act is it really gave people more rights with uh, travel disability. And just so you know, in terms of pictures, all the slides are on the website, so you can download everything. But the bottom line is that um, 
this is up for renewal this year, and it's really important for us to get on there and, and get on and give feedback, but also for our clients too, because there are a lot of amendments being proposed to this. So the uh, Air Carrier Access Act of 86, um, again, actually gave folks with uh, disabilities that up some additional rights when it came to air travel. So they, uh, and a, a airline cannot refuse transportation based on disability. However, there, it's left to interpretation because if a pilot deems that the, there is a safety risk with that person on the plane, they can refuse transportation. Um, so there is some interpretation to this. They have to provide a written explanation to the person though. Um, I don't know how quickly that has to happen, but the, you know the new legislation that's coming definitely dives deeper into some of that and, and provides some additional rights to folks with disabilities. Um, it, the airline, a person with a disability does not have to provide advance notice to take a flight. However, for ease of transportation, planning is always advisable. But if it's a, you know, they have a death in the family, they can't plan that flight. They have to get on the plane and get going. Now, some airlines can require up to 48 hours notice because of, say, a ventilator or something like that that needs power as the person travels. So there are instances where they can require more time. Um, an airline technically cannot require an attendant to travel with someone. If they deem that an attendant has to go with the person, they cannot charge the person for the attendant. The attendant must be able to travel for free. So there were some additional rights in this bill that people with disabilities did uh, gain with ac for access. Um, and then one thing, there is a little caveat to that. The person in the wheelchair has to be able to exit independently. And if you can't exit independently, which a lot of people in power wheelchairs can't, then they need to have an attendant with them. So there is a little bit of yep. a note So after 1990, um, any aircraft with 30 or more seats um, needed movable aisle armrests in uh, at least half the aisle seats. So of course, what is the most accessible seat on the plane, probably to someone in a wheelchair, right? The bulkhead seat. Because if they have someone traveling with them, they can help take care of them. They can give, help them lean forward for pressure reliefs. That is the one seat in the aircraft that does not, this, the armrests don't move. And so there's a challenge with that. Um, now, any of the wide body aircrafts um, have to have accessible lavatories. So any of these aircrafts with two aisles have accessible lavatories. Um, and an aircraft with 100 or more seats needs to provide storage within the cabin for a fold-in wheelchair. And if they have greater than 60 seats, um, an accessible lavatory and an onboard wheelchair has to be, ex has to be available. Um, so there are some things in place now, but the new legislation we'll talk about at the end of the presentation is bringing more, more rights to the uh, disabled communities, um, uh, more rights to the table for them. All righty, so I think we, we all understand the different risks of da damage to the, both the client and to the equipment and how that's a big problem. When the equipment's on the, um, when, the, when you're transporting a power wheelchair, the biggest time that there is damage to the wheelchair is when it's getting into the hold of the wheelchair, of the um, plane, the process to get it into that hold of the plane and then also when it's being uh, transported in the hold of the plane because it often will move around and or luggage will fall on it and damage the different components of the chair. So a big part of the process is just having all of us and having our clients understand what is the process and then how do we help increase everybody's control over that process. And um, part of that is um, coming up with a bunch of strategies and considerations to just make it easier. So one of them is allowing a lot of time. So for most of us, for domestic travel, we allow an hour of time. For people in using power wheelchairs, they should be allowing at least two hours for that domestic flight and three hours for international flights. And it's just because there's so much communication that they have to do from start to finish just to get to the gate. The second big strategy is just being prepared for each step of the process. 
and making sure that they know their uh, wheelchair. So many people are just not familiar with, okay, how wide is my chair? How high is my chair? What type of batteries do I have? These are questions that the airline or personnel is asking the person and they need to know when they're checking in. And so they also have to think about um, how much assistance do I need? Do I need, when I get to the airport, two people to help me with uh, uh, transfer? Or can I do it with one person? Or can I do it myself? Because I may be able to do it as long as I have an armrest. So, and then the last big consideration there when they're, you're thinking of travel is how long is the flight? And so if it's a short flight, a lot of times people can manage their bladder on each end of it. But if it's a longer flight, they have to really be mindful of, okay, I need to do bladder management before I get to the gate, after I check in, and I need to be able to do bladder management right when I, you know, during the flight, and how do we manage that? And there's a lot of strategies for that. Also, what am I sitting on in the airplane seat uh, for skin protection? You know, a lot of times you'll hear uh, therapists say, oh, you can take your wheelchair seat and cushion and use it in the plane. And you technically can take off some of the, um, the cushions in the um, Boeing aircrafts and stuff and put the wheelchair cushion on there. But many times the flight attendants and all are not aware of it or uh, it's not, for whatever reason, it doesn't work on that particular aircraft. And then if you put the person's wheelchair cushion on top of the airline seat, they're so high that they have no stability from the armrest or anything like that. So then they're unstable in the seat. So you just want to be man, uh, mindful of what that seat cushion is. So many times uh, we recommend people travel with a smaller, lower cushion just for travel purposes. The other thing to keep in mind is with air cushions, even though it's a pressurized cabin, you're going up in elevation. So that air is going to expand. So it's not going to perform the same way. So it's another thing people have to think about. Right. So the strategy for that is when you're halfway during the, into the flight, a lot of times you take air out of the cushion so that it, because it's always going to do exactly what Jay's saying. It'll blow up even more. It'll just be more firm. So the, and the point is that people don't have as no, uh, sufficient pressure distribution then. And the last thing to think about for a lot of our clients is the lack of circulation in their legs. And so do they wear compression stockings to help because that often gets exacerbated on flights and with travel. So one way to try to make sense of all this, we thought we'd uh, go through each piece of the process and just walk you through like the different parts of um, the, the um, travel process and just giving strategies to make that process as smooth as possible. So when somebody's considering travel, of course, they're making a reservation. And so if they've never flown before, a great suggestion is to have them go to the airport and meet with the airline that they're planning to travel just so they know what to expect and also the airline also knows what to expect with that particular client. And they really are very receptive to that. But the bottom line when they're making a reservation they need to identify right then and there that they're using a wheelchair. So you just don't make a flight online like we do. You have to make sure that you're communicating that whether it's a phone call or through a phone call. Then the next piece of the process would be getting to the airport and what are the challenges with that. Then we'll go through pre-boarding and we broke that up into three different components just to make sense of it. Then boarding itself, then the stowage process for the wheelchair, and then what happens with landing for people in power mobility. So I think I covered like what to do with making a reservation. The biggest, um, the biggest um, helpful strategy is making sure that you call the airline and you just have that communication. And when you do check in before going to the airport, like 24 hours in, adva in advance where we all like check in on our phones and just we get our boarding passes, they should call the airline at that point as well and just make sure that it's all noted in there in the file and in the ticket that they have a power wheelchair and that they're going to need an aisle chair, et cetera. So what you're going to hear throughout is that clients, unfortunately, have to have the same conversation over and over with multiple people just to make this a successful uh, trip for them. And so you're going to hear that conversation again and again. So um, a big thing for our clients is also making sure they're really prepared. So one is what do they have in their travel bag, making sure they have emergency, um, their medications if there's delays on flights, et cetera, any respiratory equipment that they may need, 
and of course room for their, all the items that would come off of their power wheelchair. And so they need to explore this in advance, make sure the bag's big enough to be able to hold and manage all that equipment. And of course, um, having things like duct tape and wire ties and all that, just if something goes wrong, you could quickly do a, a fast repair job. You know, I say a, no, a wheelchair clinic is not a great clinic if they don't have duct tape, <laughs> because we often need to use it in a pinch. By no means is it any long-term solution, but it'll get you um, out of that immediate situation. Some other things to think about is um, a wheelchair sign. This has probably been the most successful thing that um, uh, is used with travel. Um, everybody in the process really, really, really appreciates this sign. And this sign makes all the difference um, with having a successful flight. So what would be on that sign is just six major points that you're gonna, the client in the chair is gonna communicate to their, um, to the airline personnel. And the big thing about it is, one, is making sure they know the weight of the equipment, that you, most people will, um, a great strategy is using the Q-strain straps. Everybody knows those blue straps that people use when they're um, traveling um, in a motor vehicle, and they just need a little more length to, have to hook the straps onto. Those four blue, blue Q-strain blue Q straps are incredible. And if you put them on the transport brackets of the chair, it gives the airline personnel lifting points. Otherwise, they're lifting from the joystick or for the, from the armrest that flips up, et cetera. And so that is a big strategy as well, but just having those blue lifting straps, telling them only to lift the chair because they need to lift it at times with four people if they have to, to make sure they know how to lock and unlock the chair. So where are those motor release levers? and have them labeled if you can, like with tape, colored tape or something like that. A really big thing is to tell them not to take it downstairs. It sounds like common sense, but things, you know, everybody's trying to get it done. They have flight times. They're trying to make them sure the flight leaves on time. And they're like, well, we can just get it down right here. We have four big guys. You're like, absolutely not. If you can avoid it, use an elevator. And we'll look at that, some strategies for that. And the last is when there's a situation, they can call the client. So the client should have their cell phone on them. And right there, uh, the number really handy for them. And these are just different versions of the signs that people have made. And I mean, one client put on, you know, the, this chair cost $120,000. They just wanted them to appreciate the dollars because people don't appreciate how how, sometimes if they don't hear the personal story, they'll appreciate that this is an expensive piece of equipment. The other is that people will add little things to their signs like, these are my legs, please take care of it. And so just to try to help um, so that the airline personnel knows that this is affecting me, this is more than just a piece of luggage. And so trying to really help them get that. So those signs are huge and making, having our clients make those signs are um, a great suggestion. The other is um, having a checklist uh, for, okay, where is the transportation once I'm getting there to the airport? Okay, so even though clients will arrange for like van companies to bring them to the airport, they should always have like a backup situation because I've heard many times and been in a situation where you have it all arranged, the van transportation company's coming, that everything's gonna be on time, you're gonna be at the airport early. And then the day before, two days before, they're like, our van lift broke. We can't bring you. And so you have to be mindful of that. And so making sure if clients are using that type of transportation to have a backup. Um, and just making sure they have, um, with the travel bag, printing tons of signs. And so with those signs, they should probably have at least 10 of them for a trip. So you can put them all over the chair as on two parts of the chair coming and going. And also give it to the airline personnel at different uh, parts of the process. When we're thinking about the transportation to the airport, just remembering um, that there is the planes, they've made a lot of effort to make a lot of the trains and buses accessible. So just to be mindful of that, like on all the trains, they'll pull out Amtrak, um, LIRR, or whatever, the, the subway system, even they have ramps if there's too big a gap between the platform and the actual train itself. And they're pretty easily accessible. 
and just seeing like the different lifts. And I think Jay's going to talk more about this, so I won't go into this any further. But just being mindful of this is a part of the stress in airline travel getting to the airport. And if a person does have their own van, one good thing to know is many of the airports will give them short term parking at the long term rates. So a little bit of a reduced rate for them if they're to have closer parking to the actual airport. So that's advantageous as well and good to know. Um, I think this is when you're looking at someone traveling with a power wheelchair. And as I said, they often have other equipment as well. You can see how it gets pretty cumbersome. And so there's a rolling commode chair, which is also used to travel to for suitcases and some carry on equipment, etc. So just to appreciate how it looks for a client coming and going. And when um, my colleagues and I landed here in uh, Pittsburgh, we actually saw another a woman in a power wheelchair and she had a rolling commode chair and all the luggage, etc. So it was pretty funny just to see the same type of situation right in front of us. So with the check in process that's a big deal doing it two hours in advance we talked about and this is where you're saying the same thing over and over to the this is where it starts with the ticket agent filling out the airline sign uh, uh, airline form so they actually will fill out a whole form at this point and you make sure that you're identifying the needs with the aisle chair to get um, onto the plane at this point and that you need how many people one or two people to assist you with that and um, with all the wheelchair stuff and sorry um, with the wheelchair um, components it's really important that the clients know the height which is the highest point of the chair in its most compact position the length of the chair with the wheelchairs in its um, trailing position and also the leg rest off the weight of the chair without with the comp where how it is when they don't have the, all the components that they're taking the batteries that's a big thing that clients often don't remember and they're like is it wet is it dry so just knowing it's a dry or a sealed gel cell battery is a big deal and then of course um reminding them that they're, you're going to take off a bunch of pieces this is an example of some of the forms and you can see all the detail that goes into it and they give like a record locator number for the chair they go into each of the details in terms of um you know what is um how to lift it and those carry straps etc so that's all listed on the airline uh, form as well and they tape it to the chair it's just that it's buried in a lot of the um, the language there so a lot of times the people who are loading it and unloading it don't look at this sign and so it's really the ticket agent at the gate who looks at it and that's why the your personal wheelchair sign or the clients one is really important and just remembering that also um, and reinforcing to our clients to make sure that they go all the way to the gate in their wheelchair because once it goes into like a conveyor belt system it's a whole other story so making sure they know go all the way to the gate with your chair. And if you're bringing other equipment like a commode chair etc make sure that also is a gate check item and not giving it to baggage claim. Because again that will get damaged and they'll get there and there'll be issues with the wheels or whatever is moving on there because it's impossible for the the way that the whole airline um luggage conveyor system works everything really needs to be kind of compact and and um and wrapped up and so commode chair is really ripe for just um, all kinds of damage and so they are allowed to bring this all the way to the gate and just being mindful of that as well when people go through security um, for the next step of the process just knowing that they can bypass most of the line um, they don't have to transfer out of the chair that's another big thing um, to know and then also um, it's helpful if you have like um, TSA or global entry a little bit just to make that process a little bit quicker. But regardless, it's still a complex, it's a more involved process and clients need to um, often um, direct a lot of it. Thank you. Thank you. This just notate that the battery is acceptable. Mm -hmm. it's registered with the airline. And then, so this is what Jared will sit on. I will also take the cushion off when they transfer him out. Um, but this is what he'll sit on on the plane. It's another Rojo cushion. And then they're checking our manual wheelchair. 
So traveling with that backup manual wheelchair is also helpful if you're really concerned about damage on the other end. Some residue. So they always do that residue test as well with the clients. Um, it's just for the clients to know to expect it. It's not something unusual. It's just typical. I'm oh, sorry. So anyway, then after the person goes to TSA, they need to get to the gate. And so the recommendation is always to go to the gate as soon as possible and um, just wait for the, for the gate attendants to show up. And so a lot of times, depending again on the length of the flight, people should think about their bladder management needs on the way to the gate and, and uh, take care of that. And so once the clients are at the gate, another great strategy is making sure they go right to the ticket agent and identify their needs, just confirm the seat um, and just make sure they have like that bulkhead seating or whatever it is that they need there. Confirm again that they have the aisle chair coming and that there should be, however, one or two people to help them with the transfer. And then also two other requests that are really, really helpful um, is one, to ask to speak to the head um, baggage claim um, agent, and the other is to speak to the pilot when they come. And this all takes minutes, like it's not like long conversations that the client would be having with them, but just quick words about, okay, here's my chair. These are the four lifting straps for it. This is the sign I'm going to put on it. This is how, and talk to the pilot about the plane itself. Because, I mean, sorry, not the pilot, the baggage claim person about the, the plane itself. And why? Because a lot of uh, there, it's not unusual. Sometimes a plane will get switched out. So a client may know what plane they're traveling when they make the reservation, but sometimes that could be changed and say they want to confirm the plane. And why is that important? Because the hold sizes are different. So for this particular instruction, then one of the discussion points with that baggage claim um, uh, agent is what, how high do I need to, or how much do I need to recline the back support so it's going to fit in the hold upright. And that's a big thing for the clients to do before they get out of the chair, to know that they're reclining that back to the height that's going to fit in that particular hold. There are some planes, the Airbus 320s, that um, the hold door is, is nice and wide and open, and you can actually leave the power wheelchairs upright in those chairs, in those planes. So just to be mindful of that and to know that. But again, the airplane can be changed, and so that needs to be confirmed at that particular point. So the Bottom of the line is don't assume anything. And the reason to speak to the pilot at this point is to give him the sign because you're already, that client's controlling the situation on the loading end from their, the, the airport they're leaving. But now what happens at the destination airport? You know, you have this piece of equipment that's coming out and the people, the often the baggage agents don't know a lot about it. There's not really clear communication all the way through. And so uh, many times what, will, what is done is you give the uh, pilot a copy of the sign and ask him to communicate with the baggage crew when they land. And I didn't realize this, and I actually had a video of it, but I, um, there were too many videos in the presentation. But um, the pilot actually told us that they, op they can open those front windows in a plane. I didn't know that they could do that. And he actually took the sign and like, just put it out the window to the baggage agent. I thought that was hysterical. I'm like, all right. <laughs> you know, in our time, you know, with all our cell phones and all the technology, you'd think that it gets entered into the system and then there's communication on the other end and still there's a big gap with that. And so the biggest um, strategy for the client is, or our clients is to make sure they know to educate people and they just have to keep saying the same story over and over but just to make sure it's successful. And that pilot communication on that destination end is also key. And so those are some really good strategies, I think, for um, the baggage uh, when the person is at the gate checking in. Then once you go to the boarding process now, the key is for the client to go all the way to the door of the plane. And some of the regulations are that, um, and, uh, that the clients should be pre-boarded before anybody else on that plane. 
And so that, I think, was revised in like 2008 or something like that, and that amendment was there clarifying when pre-boarding is. And so that's where the airline personnel will help them with transfers and onto the plane. And so just to know, these are typically the, um, the Stasi and the Air Master Columbia. They are the typical airline chairs that you'll see in most airports. Clients don't have choices to say which one they want. It's what the airline actually has. And the advantage of the Stasi for a client would be if they do independent transfers, there's at least that armrest thing there. Whereas the, the um, Isle Master Columbia doesn't have any armrest or anything. So just to know that if some of the clients say with a C7 type spinal cord injury or somebody with MS who can transfer themselves, that may make their transfer more difficult. So make sure they have the airline personnel help them with the transfer. And the biggest thing for our clients is when they're doing that transfer to make sure they direct them all the way through. And you, you'll see the video of people doing that as well. To know also there is a dependent lifter. Um, it's the Three Eagle lift. It's not really popular in the US at all. I don't think it's ever been, I don't know of it being used in the US, but it is used in Canada and Australia. So just to be aware that that is out there. And again, it's just all like we're all evolving and this industry is evolving, but that would be maybe an improvement for us in the US to make it easier for some of our clients as well and maybe a little more safe. With the boarding process, I think you get the gist again. This is the communication again to everybody at this point, making sure they know how to do the transfer. And then just, uh, we already talked about all those, if you are going to be in that bulkhead seating, if the client's gonna be sitting there, the, the armrests don't come down, so they have to be lifted over it. This is just some pictures of the transfers and what's happening at different points. And so you can see, you know, people are out on the tarmacs getting transferred at points. Um, and you can see the chair doesn't have a lot of support. So the biggest thing with all the straps when the clients see the chairs is that they're kind of always tangled up a little bit. So just making sure all the straps get untangled and they're wrapped around them for when they are in that aisle chair. That's a big thing to just make sure they direct because a lot of times the, person, the people helping them are just in a rush to get them in and don't realize, hey, they have no balance. They're going to fall over. And so that's a big thing just to be mindful of with the straps and all. Um, this is a quick video of the um, of a transfer just to see, and that's like a low profile rojo on the actual um, on the actual airline scene. So I think you guys saw the transfer, and you can see how he's directing everybody. Get me strapped in, so I don't. I'm sorry. I'm not going to let you go All right. And then, yeah, if we can just get his legs strapped in tight. Thank you. Ta-da! Right. We get the gist of that, but just, it's a two, you know, for a lot of our clients, it'll be a two-person lift to have it as safe as possible. And so, and the airline personnel are really great with it as long as they have that communication. So the wheelchair storage, I think we talked a little bit about this at different points, but bottom line is taking all the parts off of it, uh, making sure the foot plates are flipped up. If it's, if it's uh, rainy or snowy weather, making sure then that the client has those bags in their, um, their travel bag and they you know, wrap it around. So it's protecting at the very minimal, the seat cushion that they're gonna be sitting on and hopefully the electronics as well. Um, and the biggest thing for our clients to remember is they know their equipment better than anyone. And so there are tons of different types of wheelchairs. It's really important. They just stay really patient and communicate. Other strategies for maximum success is just making sure when they do get out of the chair that the laterals get folded in, the joystick gets folded in. Um, some of the joysticks, like Invicares, you can actually take it off and put it in the travel bag. So that even ensures more safety there. But uh, a lot of the other companies, you know, with Permobile and with um, Quantum, you can swing the joystick in and then have it like secured to the inside of the arm so it's less vulnerable. Uh, making sure if there's any straps, like their seatbelt, don't leave it dangling to get caught in the wheels because that's another disaster. So just making sure they don't forget to just do those basic things like tying the seatbelts. Um, there are, um, 
protective crates and stuff that people have designed and created themselves, but that gets really in the weeds and it gets to a whole other level of, of uh, travel and just does make it a lot more, uh, you know, for that particular person, it makes it easier and their chair is more protected, but there is equipment that the airline has themselves and we'll go into that as well. So just to, to appreciate all the different um, um, ways to set up the chair. And then this is where the signs would go, one on the front, one on the back of the wheelchairs. And then also the other thing here is take a picture of it. I think that's a really good thing for whoever's helping the client to just take a quick picture of how the chair is set up for that. And so then in the next slide, what you're gonna see is this is a gate elevator. So this is something that's at a lot of airports, not necessarily every gate has it, but the, the gate itself in the frame there, you see there's like an elevator piece, there's that frame that came apart. And I took a picture on the, of it on the left where you see it's lower than the actual platform. So that goes all the way down to the, the floor and comes all the way up. So that's how a lot of the wheelchairs, the power wheelchairs can easily get down quickly into the cargo hold. That's also what they do with all the gate checked luggage, uh, the gate checked luggage a lot of times. It's not on every single gate, but it's just knowing that if it's not at that gate, having the airline personnel bring it to a gate that has that and making sure that is on the, the wheelchair sign because that's a big deal. And then you can see this, for this particular airline, we had to really recline the chair a lot. So you can see it's really low down so it can fit in the cargo hold. And just to appreciate different things that happen with the airlines, you can see then the rolling commodes down there and they're managing that. And then the, the picture on the right, you can see, um, I took it at this level for you to appreciate the conveyor belt and what they need to do to lift these chairs many times onto these conveyor belts. Hopefully they don't have to, but many, many times they have to do this. And so making sure the client has those four Q strain straps on it and making sure they know four people to do it, um, that's an important piece on the um, actual sign. But there are strategies around um, lifting onto the conveyor belt. So it's just having the airline personnel get trained and, and use the strategies without feeling they lose too much time in the process. And so you can see how why so much damage can happen to chairs because they are still lifting them even though they have equipment. So a big strategy you'll see in some of the pictures coming up, uh, I have some videos of that. One thing I just wanted to do is this is Open Doors organization. And um, about a few, I think this is almost five years ago now that they went and they, they took, one of the guys actually did a chart and measured all the holes on all the Boeing uh, aircrafts and stuff. So just to be aware of that, that's what this chart is, and it's in your handouts, just so you have it. But just to know the Airbus 320, which is a really popular um, airline, like JetBlue uses it a lot for most of their fleet, et cetera, for lots of other reasons, but one of them is because of that big cargo door. And for that one plane, you can definitely leave the wheelchair fully upright for that, the power wheelchairs. And it just makes it so much easier. These are some pictures so you can see the, um, the conveyor belt and what happens when the chair's on the conveyor belt. Um, and so let me play these videos for you so you can see. Okay. okay. And so you can see the wheelchairs are often wider there than, we go. than conveyor belts. And so that's where there's a big problem. So this one particular time, this guy actually pushed it up the conveyor belt. So this is the stuff that's actually happening. So I don't want him to push it. We all know how heavy these chairs are. And instead of, he's going with it on the conveyor belt there. But it really wants to move around. You see how the chair is like having a hard time staying on that conveyor belt. So this is what's happening with our client's chairs when they don't see it. Then this is really helpful to see, look at the hold size. So you can appreciate how difficult it is for these airline personnel really trying to make this work for our clients. So, and remember these are like 400 and something pounds here. For the body mechanics and all. This is really cool. I think that 
gives everyone a good feel for like what happens with, um, with loading it in the plane. Let's go to the next video. Thank you. Awesome, guys. Come fly with me. Let's fly. Let's fly away. Here we go. Oh, we good? Yeah. The back foot. Ready? This is really cool. This is a video that's posted online at PositivelyParalyzed.com and it's good for our clients to know of it because it really will help them to understand the process more. And now the biggest thing for this is making sure the, the uh, airline personnel now really secure that aircraft, that, that wheelchair in position here. Because again, this is where a lot of the damage happens in the actual hold. You can imagine with turbulence what's happening. And you can imagine, you know, what's happening when um, the plane lands and like when the pilot has to make a shorter stop or whatever the case is, that chair is getting bounced around as well or luggage is falling on it. So some things to just know is that the... Um, there should be a, a curtain in the actual hold, at least to keep the wheelchair away from the luggage compartment. If they, I mean, the wheelchair away from the uh, suitcases. And if they don't have the curtain, they may even have a whole separate component that uh, piece uh, in a whole room, like a little area where they can put the actual wheelchair. So just to be aware of that, that that's um, some of the regulation as well. And so at least if they could use the curtain, it'll minimize the risk of luggage falling on the actual power wheelchair and causing that damage. But the, this is a really great video here. This is a piece of equipment that's available at a lot of airports. And um, when we were in Louisville, Kentucky, um, one of our, this one person that I, I met down there, she, her, her father worked for the actual airlines for American. So American knew that United had this piece of equipment down there. So they actually borrowed it from United for this woman's chair. And where do you see this uh, video? And you can see how it makes the chair process so much easier for all the people um, in that under wing crew uh, trying to just make this successful. So this is actually, um, you see the front and the back of this actual piece of um, equipment. It's just a, um, something they can roll the power wheelchair on and you can see the power wheelchair on it in full recline but now it doesn't have to they don't have to deal with that whole lifting of it and then also it can go right into the cargo hold in this and then just be slid right um, over so you'll see it go up the conveyor belt and that lift over there um, after like some of the process with this particular woman in um, in Boston, and her, her, as I said, her father worked for American Airlines. American Airlines bought this for every one of their, um, every airport that they have um, their, their, um, that their plans, planes land in. So just to know that, like, but sometimes it takes this grassroots work to try to make a difference there. So it just makes it so much easier on the chair. It does, the wheels don't get caught up in that whole conveyor belt and the poor guy trying to hold it or push it and keep it stable, a 450 pound chair going up that conveyor belt. It just makes that whole process so much safer for everybody. With the airline seat, I think we kind of went into it a bit, making sure people are in the bulkhead so they can do a pressure relief. If they can't do a push up, they can do a full forward uh, lean and that will help. And then we talked about taking the air out of the cushion mid-flight. Other things to help our clients be stable in the uh, airplane seats uh, is um, the body point um, universal straps work really well or any type of belt that they can put around them. And then just, um, of course, making sure that whatever cushion they're sitting on, that it's a low one to give them at least some skin protection from the airline seat itself. And then all the traditional things people travel with, uh, whether it's a neck roll, a back thing, something to support somebody's feet if their feet don't reach the floor, etc. So just uh, making sure that they're aware to make sure they do have support, because there's nothing worse than getting off a long flight and you're in agony when you get to your destination because you didn't have good support for X hours. 
The other thing is just managing the bladder on the plane and how to do that. So, you know, depending on how long the flight is, people can do things like um, if they do intermittent catheterization, um, make sure that you know, they can do like tenting where they put the um, like the uh, blanket over their lap and do the catheterization there if they can't access the bathroom. If they can access the bathroom because it's an international flight, the airline crew will often have a chair to help them with that. And those are the wide body planes. Um, also, if people have a leg bag and they don't really have to transfer for that, what they could do is just put it into a bottle and then like dump it in the bathroom. And so one of my clients uses the Mount, he always has a Mountain Dew bottle with him and he just feels like, you know, then the urine doesn't look like urine in that bottle. So it's a little more savvy, you know, like he just, you know, and so it just helps for him going to the, um, the bathroom or his wife doing it. Um, and so just knowing that people have different strategies, there are also bags and things that people use for hiking where you can empty the, the urine into it and it'll turn into a gel type material and stuff. So it, you can put it in a, in a garbage bag. So just to know different strategies out there uh, for people and just to help them just remember to do that because you know, hydration is everything. And if our clients then end up with UTIs because they didn't drink, because they didn't want to have to use the bathroom, there goes the trip again. So it's another important variable to be mindful of. A big thing with landing is, you know, if our clients don't have any trunk control because they're using a power wheelchair for that reason, just making sure somebody's helping to give them stability in that plane so that their whole body doesn't fall forward with the landing. And often, um, this is my husband, I'll pull him out, like pull his legs out a little so he's more slumped to have a little stability there as well. Um, big thing for our client to also let clients know um, to make sure they stay on the plane until their wheelchair gets to the door of the plane. Because too often, of course, everybody, the pilot, the airline crew want to leave and they have other things to do as well. And once they're gone, the travel process can take longer. But um, if you're stuck in those seats, people can get pressure injuries and stuff and they don't have any support, so it can be very uncomfortable. So making sure they wait for the wheelchair to get to the door of the plane before they get out of the airline seat is a big strategy. The other is um, once it does, the wheelchair does get to the jetway. If they can have someone go and just take a quick glance at the chair, make sure nothing's broken that's obvious and things like that, just because that'll it's the time to start looking at that. And so once somebody then is um, transferred in the jetway, and you've seen the transfer before, they don't look pretty. They just have to get out of the jetway, but just get enough stability to get up the ramp, and then they can get all settled once they're in the airport and then go to the bathroom and do all that kind of stuff. But these are just some strategies not to forget also with our clients. If they're going to a destination where it's not into an airport itself and the plane's landing on the ground and then people have to go down the steps, they do have these ramps. But what do clients do if they're being pushed forward down the ramp in the airplane seat, they're going to fall forward. And so just making sure they remember the normal strategies they use, like going backwards on a ramp and things like that. And this is just a video. You can appreciate how difficult that is. I keep doing that. But you know what happens quick. So landing in the terminal, I think we said it, just get settled and then uh, check the chair really thoroughly at this point and take pictures. That's a big strategy at this point. And then once you get to baggage claim, when you pick up your luggage, if there's any issues, that's where you would report um, the problem right there in baggage claim. And so doing it right away is key. If the clients say, I gotta go, I gotta go, I have transportation, you know, because something was delayed and they don't report it, that's an issue. And then also just knowing that a lot of the American airlines um, in the US, they'll replace, I mean, if there's damage, at, they will actually even replace a whole wheelchair. But in the European countries, there's regulations where most of their regulations match the US uh, regulations. However, they do have a, a cap in some countries and it's important for the client to know that. So sometimes they may choose to not travel, say Norwegian Air and travel an American company like um, United to make sure they're more safe with that. All right, so once they arrive at the destination, how are they gonna get around? So again, are they using public transportation? It's really interesting. I was over in Europe back in January and 
three of the taxis that I took when I was in London, they all were wheelchair accessible. Um, so a lot of the uh, European countries have very accessible public transportation already available for folks. Um, you know, again, if it's a bus, you know, Mary talked about that circumstance where the bus lift had a 300 pound weight capacity, checking those things out ahead of time. Local train system, um, find out from um, the local government or the local um, chamber of commerce or whoever you can access to be able to find out, are there metros level to get in and out of with a wheelchair? Um, often there's spaces, it's not as big a deal often for a power chair that there's a little bit of a gap when the uh, metro, the uh, subway train pulls up, but for a manual wheelchair, that can be a really big deal with the, uh, low, with the small front wheels. The shuttle service for the hotel, um, is it accessible? Do they have tie downs for a power wheelchair on the actual shuttle itself? And then again, if you, once you get there, are you renting a van? Um, you know, make sure that they're call ahead, make sure they're going to be there on time. Where is the van going to be located? If you're using a private driver, again, can't stress enough, check out their reviews, make sure that they actually show up on time. Um, nothing worse than coming in on an international flight and finding that your ride is not there. Um, so just some other things from a safety perspective of transporting, of course, we've got WC-19, WC-20, WC-19 involving crash testing. Um, we'll talk about that here. So four permanently labeled securement brackets. Um, also be aware that just because you get a power chair and it has tie downs, it doesn't mean it's occupied tie down system. You have to order the chair that way. Um, on the bottom picture, there's two, two arrows pointing to two securement points for the separate pelvic belt that comes with a occupied tie down system that is WC19 um, approved. So again, you've got four straps that go from the tie downs. The four uh, securement points are labeled on the chair and those four straps attach to the vehicle floor. And then of course, the crash worthy pelvic belt. That is not your positioning belt. That is a separate belt and it has an attachment point for a shoulder strap that goes to the vehicle itself. So it is a different system. But again, make sure that the vehicles you're gonna be using has this type of securement system available in it because the worst thing in the world is to get to your destination, get in an accident and not be tied down securely and be injured. Um, also, when you're talking about buses, this is a research study that was looked at and they looked at layout three here where the person is towards the back of the bus. <clears throat> Opposite of the lift is the easiest in and out for the bus but also being a um you know if somebody's going to be using public transportation those of us doing the evaluations drive wheel configuration can play a very big part in this the ease of getting in and then getting out um, how much space is going to be needed for that person this is all these are all things we need to be thinking about in that evaluation process and making sure that the person who uses the power chair who wants to be able to travel is aware of checking these things out ahead of time before they get to their destination. So like Mary talked about little things that make a difference, not only on the plane, but having that hydration with them throughout their vacation and while they're traveling, having their bladder, their bladder management supplies with them throughout the time that they're traveling. Um, if they're in a vehicle, um, you know, not all countries are going to have the same securement system, so they might have to modify things a little bit for their own personal safety. Um, being able to ship a folding ramp to where you're going, um, even if it's just a hotel. Um, you know, I've been to a lot of hotels that say it's an accessible bathroom. Um, it's a tub. Okay, how is a person in the wheelchair, if they travel with a shower chair, how are they going to get in? Uh, we all use Airbnb, we all use VBRO, all these different uh, ways of being able to save money when we travel, but ex an accessible bathroom means different things to different people. So the person in a power chair really has to investigate this ahead of time. If they need a roll-in shower, make sure that is available when they get there, not an accessible tub. Um, but even when they get to the location, you know, all of the places they're going to go, different places they're going to visit. If you're going to a different country, 
that's not as developed as where you're coming from, having that ramp, that suitcase ramp with you can make or break your vacation to be able to get into the places you want to go. And then, of course, um, there is new um, there is a new act coming through um, again, it gives additional benefits for, for individuals with disabilities there's a link on the bottom here we're running a little short on time so i'm not going to go through this, but all the information is here click on that link and really um, you know support this act it's really important to those folks that are traveling in our wheeled mobility that we're supplying to them. Tomorrow there is a presentation in the morning um, that's going to happen, and um, they're going to go through additional information. Please support them. Go to the um, presentation. Um, very knowledgeable individuals. They're going to do a lot more on advocacy and all the regulations. I mean, this has gotten travel has exploded in the last ten years, so you'll see a lot of great. It's a whole different presentation that they're doing there with a lot of the different organizations who are even looking into having people use their wheelchairs in the actual plane itself. So there's a lot of work being done with that. Uh, just some resources for you. I know we as a manufacturer at Quantum are starting to put together additional resources for people traveling with power equipment, um, making sure they have access to good good resources. And just to wrap things up here, uh, Mary will take us back here and wrap it up. So I think the key for all our clients is just making sure they know to do a lot of advanced preparation, communicate, be patient, and be flexible. I think those are the key take home messages for them with this and just having them understand a lot of the process. The Some of the manufacturer websites have a lot of great information on them as well. And the other thing is just for them to allow a lot of time for this to be successful. If they're running late, it's just gonna end up making the process very stressful and maybe not successful. But I think in the presentation, you got a really good feel for what the procedure is and helping to educate them on some strategies to make it as successful as possible. So um, thank you so much, guys. Yeah, and if anybody has problems downloading the, um, the PDF, um, you can email either of us. We both have copies of it as well. Uh, any questions on anything?